The greatest danger in life is not setting your mark too high and falling short. The greatest danger is setting your goals too low and achieving them. To learn more, stay tuned for Reach Out and Live. Welcome to Reach Out and Live, a program of music, scripture, and sermon brought to you each week by the many viewers and members of First Plymouth Church, Lincoln, Nebraska. Hi, my name's Jim, minister here at First Plymouth. I'm in my sermon series on the seven heavenly virtues. We have the Doan Choir and the congregation is ready for worship. Let's join them. Bismillah, from Quran we read, Rather, they say, Indeed, we found our fathers upon a religion, and we are in their footsteps guided. And similarly, we did not send before you any warner into a city, except that its affluent said, Indeed, we found our fathers upon a religion, and we are in their footsteps following Quran 43, 22, 23. For more than 18 times comes in the Quranic text the command to think and to think for ourselves and to reflect upon every verse. In this particular verse, however, comes to the command and the attention the verse brings the attention, our attention, to the responsibility of thinking and even of rethinking our religious beliefs as a responsibility that should be taken personally to be fully accomplished. For sure then, the seeds for progressive, successive understandings of the religious text are already implemented in the text itself in the Quranic text, as well in the biblical text, as we read, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Timothy 2, 7. The reading for this morning is from the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the, letter of, to the people of Philippi. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. 14 million. There were 14 million sermons preached in America just last year. That's a lot of sermons. I'm actually lowballing that estimate. There are 350,000 churches, but I'm just taking 270,000. But lots of churches preach multiple times, but I'm taking a conservative number, 270,000 times 52. That gets me to 14 million. 
and now more calculations. The average sermon in a Roman Catholic church, the homily is about 10 to 12 minutes. In the typical evangelical Protestant church, the sermon can be up to 45 minutes. So I'll take a conservative middle ground, let's just say 20 minutes. So if you wanted to listen to all 14 million sermons from last year, would anyone want to do that? <laughs> you would have to sit in that pew for over 500 years, continuously, no potty break. That's a lot of preachifying. Now, what I can't calculate, oh, by the way, it may have seemed like you've been sitting there 500 years during those calculations, <laughs> but what I can't calculate is how many sermons in America last year were preached upon the seven deadly sins. This has become wildly popular to do a sermon series on that medieval rhetorical contrivance of the seven deadly sins. It was mostly a rhetorical device, a mnemonic device, and so it became immensely popular for preaching. Seven deadly sins. The phrase itself is soaked with drama. It's got archetypal power, seven. That sounds scary and powerful. Seven deadly, ooh, ominous. Sins doubly ominous. Ooh, seven deadly sins. And so it's very typical now for preachers in America to go all medieval on you, and they'll preach the dark, deadly sins. I mean, even in churches with rock bands and middle-aged ministers wearing jeans that are too tight, that are walk <laughs> walking around just preach and sit, and they do these seven-week sermon series, so that's sin, 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 sin. Now, my friends, sin is an important theological concept, but seven weeks in a row, it could send that old message that church is somehow more about chastisement and judgment than it is what we know it is about forgiveness beyond our wildest imagination, that you are loved beyond what you could fathom. Well, I'm not going to preach on the deadly sins. I decided to do a sermon series on a medieval corollary. There was in the Middle Ages also the seven heavenly virtues, you may have never heard of that. You don't give many sermon series on that. But I want to preach on the seven heavenly virtues. The medieval church took four cardinal virtues from Plato and Aristotle. The four cardinal virtues of the Greek philosophers were prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. And then the medieval theologians added the theological virtues they found in Paul, 1 Corinthians 13. So prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, then faith, hope, love. Seven heavenly virtues. I'm calling this sermon series Seven Lively Virtues to juxtapose it against deadly sins. Now when the medieval philosophers and Greek thinkers thought about virtues, they considered it the primary route to happiness or fulfillment. They considered virtues arete in Greek. Arete means excellence. Really, I could call this sermon living with excellence because they imagined if you could develop these virtues, prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, faith, hope, love, that you're climbing this ladder, you're living up to your highest self, you're striving. We tend to think of virtues this is kind of a moralizing sound and kind of pious. They thought it had to do with the fullness of your life, achieving your best self. Now, they thought about these virtues differently. So before I begin, let me remind you, their thinking is different than ours. Again, they thought it was through virtues you found your happiness. This is different. You know, we tend to think, Happiness means 
the pleasure we feel with diversionary activities and such, we tend to use the word happiness to mean I feel good. But in the Greek, eudaimonia doesn't really mean happiness, it means flourishing. And they thought that if you could achieve your highest self, then you would experience a joy, a flourishing. For the ancient Greeks, it wasn't so much I feel good as I am good. I am good, and if I attain my higher self, I will experience a joy. This is the way they thought about it. If here is how you're living life now, but here is what you're capable of, then in this gap lies all of your anxiety, your frustrations, your depression. If here is how you're living and here is what you're capable of, you've got to close this gap. If you're going to experience eudaimonia, or happiness, and so they would strive to close that gap, leave no room for that sort of sadness and melancholy of not being who you were meant to be. And the ancient Greeks, they believed you could develop these virtues. They thought you could work on your character. We tend to think you're just kind of born with your character, and in our culture, we try to develop skills and talents. That's what we do. We, 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 we want to get skills. So we work hard on skills and talents. They worked hard on character. And they took an athletic approach. Just like sports, if you want to develop your character and your virtues, you've got to practice. You've got to practice. It's in repetitions. You want to hit a golf ball well, you better swing at it 500 times on the range. Learn how to do it. Virtues are the same. They would practice them. So this sermon series is just an effort to get us working together, practicing these higher virtues. And let me begin with prudence. That sounds musty, doesn't it? Prudence. Archaic, pious-sounding. And the word has changed in modern English. When we say prudent, we mean someone who is being careful and cautious. It's changed in modern English. We mean circumspection, very careful. But in older English and in the Greek, prudent, prudent meant something else. It had more to do with wisdom and insight and self-knowledge. Prudence is the ability to choose the right action. This is what it is for the Greeks. It's a type of judgment, a wisdom, that chooses the right things. They called it the charioteur of all the virtues. Prudence doesn't act, but it allows you to choose wisely in your actions. How are your choices? I mean the biggest life choices you've made have you displayed prudence, wisdom? How have you done? Everything flows from the big choices you have made. Have you made them wisely? This is prudence. So like an ancient Greek, if we're going to work on this athletically, there's a way to develop prudence. Two main ways they would speak of. One is constant inquiry and imitation. Let me explain. Constant inquiry. Socrates said that true wisdom is knowing that you don't know anything. Right? That's where wisdom and thus prudence begins, knowing you don't know anything. So engage in constant, relentless inquiry. Be endlessly curious to learn. Don't trust one's opinions too much. But be willing to revise. Every opinion you hold for the prudent person has an element of provisionality. You might learn more and it might shift. Constantly inquire. We're not good at this in America. We're just not. 
because we're taught so often that you have to respect everybody else's opinion. This is good. This is America. Everybody has a right to an opinion. But what happens is we start to respect our own opinion too much. Prudent people don't over-respect their opinion over much. They are constantly inquiring, trying to learn more, maybe revising. But in America, you've got to rush through every day. There's no time for prudence. You have to make quick interpretations. Prudence never jumps to conclusions. Prudence suspends judgment until enough inquiry has taken place. But we got to move fast. you got to make interpretations, then you have to act on your interpretations, and you got to rock it through the day. So you make these interpretations without even checking them out. You start the day, and you pass by someone that gives you this scowl, and you think, whoa, they don't like me. You don't realize they just had a chili dog, and they have indigestion. But you make the wrong interpretation. Then you think, I'm not, I'm not likable. You go to your cubicle, you snap at the person next to you. That person makes an interpretation thinking you're mad at their quarterly report. So they start revising their whole quarterly report, and we just rush through the day interpreting other people without inquiry. Prudence is slowing down. Being curious and asking people what they mean and think and why. Prudence. And for the ancient Greeks, oh, a line's been ringing in my head about prudence. Albert Einstein said that it wasn't that he was smart, it was that he stayed in the questions longer. This is prudence. Stay in the questions. Keep learning. Or or the great wise line, knowledge speaks Wisdom listens. Oh, you hear this? Knowledge speaks. Wisdom listens. I'm quoting the great sage, Jimi Hendrix. (laughs) But he's got it right. The second way to develop prudence is through imitation. Surround yourself with people of high character that you can imitate. The Greeks thought imitation is our surest route to learning. Uh, Imitate. John Wooden said that his success was based on he always surrounded himself with people smarter than him. Make sure you have exemplars or models around. You can watch how prudent displays itself, how people make wise decisions. There's an old proverb that basically says there are three types of people. Fools, normal people, and wise ones. Now, fools will stick their hand in the fire, burn their hand, and then sometime later stick their hand back in the fire. They didn't learn. Normal people will stick their hand in the fire, pull it out, and now they've learned. They're not going to do it again. Wise ones, they never stick their hand in the fire because they were watching. (laughs) They learn from them. Yes, learn from others. Prudence. Let me shift now to the second virtue of today, justice. When I say justice, I know your mind immediately leaps to social and structural justice, you know, political justice, how's the shape of the community. But to the ancient Greeks, they meant that as an interior individual virtue first. They believed that if you had justice, that virtue of justice in the individual, then more individuals with justice would create just communities. That was the process they imagined. Now, what they meant by justice was this golden mean within yourself between selfishness and selflessness, this, this golden mean. Or, or they meant your ability to know what's fair. That's, that's what they meant. That you treat people fairly, you give people their due, you know what's fair. My friends, this virtue has been gifted to us to some measure. We have a conscience. I love this word, conscience. 
I, I think it's your God connection. You have a conscience. I, I think you just naturally know what's fair, what's right. I think it's remarkable that, that we just, we have this conscience. You know what's right. You know what's fair. However, here's the problem. Fear and anxiety can easily overwhelm your conscience. You've got it, but it's not robust all the times. If you become too anxious, too fearful, you start to defend and self-protect, you will not act fairly to others. You have a conscience, but it's fragile. I was at the stoplight of 84th and Old Cheney. About four or five cars were in a line. We're just waiting at the stoplight. It's during Lincoln's version of rush hour, which can get kind of busy now, but it was like 525 at 84th and Old Cheney. I'm sitting there. All of a sudden, I hear screeching behind me, and I look up in the rearview mirror, and I see this car's about to plow into me. It's really good to know it's coming, you know, so I, I braced myself, and bam, he plowed into the back of my car dented in my trunk. My bumper got knocked down. was just kind of hanging there. Um, and, oh, I really got rocked. And I opened the door and I waved him. But it's a really busy intersection. I said, I I'm okay. Are you okay? He goes, yeah. And we're, we're waving. I said, let's pull over to the bank over there. Let's get out of this traffic because my car could still drive. His could. He goes, okay, okay. And he looked like a dad. He was maybe 35, well put together, nice car, looked like a dad. And, and he's waving, okay. And so we got, both got in the left turn lane. But we had to wait there for a while till the left turn signal. And so we're sitting there for two or three minutes, and I'm still kind of waving at him that I'm okay, let's get over to the bank. And all the traffic's now moving on. Finally, the light turns green for the arrow. We then slow slowly pull, and my bumper's kind of hanging, but, you know, we slowly pull out, turn left, we start to turn into the bank, and just as I'm trying to slowly park my car in the bank, he hits the gas and takes off. I was, down. I was really shocked. I mean, we've been kind of communicating, and, you know, we... And it has begun me weaving all these scenarios in my imagination of what happened. He looked really, you know, just he was coming back from work. He was, looked, what happened? And I began to imagine it was the time. You see, we, we hit, but we had to slowly get in the left turn lane together, and we had to wait. And I think maybe it was like 525, 25. This is my imagination. Maybe he'd been drinking right after work. And now with time, this anxiety started to come up in him. The cops would be coming, and he was seeing his whole life. It gave, we had time as he was sitting there in the car for his conscience to become overwhelmed with anxiety. I'm sure he's a good guy. He's got a conscience. But I, I just imagine he, he became fearful, and, and there was so much time that he, he just took off. And my imagination, I mean, he's got to go home to his wife, his front end's mashed in. What's he say, I hit a brick wall or something? Or all the lies that then begin. He's got to avoid that intersection because he knows I must live near it at that time of the day. All of the things. You have a conscience, the virtue of justice within you. But if we become fearful, we'll lose our tether to it. We, we will. And so I imagine, my beloved, as Paul says, I imagine that we gather here at church in a very specific way to develop these most noble traits within us, that prudence and justice, we do so by drawing deeply into a tradition that we can imitate, the one we can imitate, Jesus Christ of the highest, most noble character, that we can watch and learn and develop that virtue, that we come here together to calm ourselves, to create that connection to our conscience and that connection to God. We calm ourselves because we know there is God. There is God. We become more peaceful here. We gain an equipoise. Beloved, think of these things, the most noble things. Listen to Paul. The most pure things, the most excellent, the virtuous, 
Think upon these things. Amen. And now on this beautiful day, go forth with prudence and justice in your heart. Go in peace. Amen. I am so glad that we had the opportunity to worship together. Do you know that this program is only made possible through the financial support of viewers like you and the members here at First Plymouth Church, Lincoln, Nebraska? If you would like to learn more about First Plymouth, go to firstplymouth.org. You can watch videos of the sermons, learn about our programs, and then follow us to Facebook and become a friend. But better than that, come to church in person. We would love to have you join us. We have a casual chapel service Saturday evenings at 5.30 p.m. Then we have three main sanctuary services on Sunday morning, one at 9, 10.30, and our contemporary worship at 11.59. Plus, we worship at Clefcorn Elementary School at 9.30, then join us downtown at the Brewskies Underground for First Plymouth Presents at 7 p.m. See you there. The ancient philosophers thought the key to happiness was developing our virtues. When we developed the most noble powers of the person, we would find our joy, and then together, we could reach out and live. Tune in again next week for another edition of Reach Out and Live. <laughs>